Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 27. Tonight's text, we are covering verses 57 through 66. The title of the message is The Secure Tomb. In our last study, we went through uh, the previous verses and basically went over the process of crucifixion, the history of crucifixion, the crucifixion that the Romans were involved in, and the process by which they would torture an individual. And I don't know if you really look at it and understand, I mean, really apply everything to it. Jesus was tortured in those 24 hours. And his torture came in the form of uh, scourging and beating and uh, all kinds of different ways that he was attacked. And we went over the seven sources or the seven places that blood was then removed from his body through his face and his head and his hands and his feet and his side, that uh, his blood, his precious blood was being spilled from every direction. And the reason for that was because that's what we deserved as sinners and yet he took it upon himself and he who knew no sin became sin for us and paid the price for the sin that he did not commit but we did and while we were still sinners he died for us and demonstrated his love for us you know it's hard enough to go through something like that i would imagine that and yet even worse i think is the the inflicting of mocking by those that were around. And it's hard enough to go through anything, but then to have the people that are surrounding you mocking your situation, mocking who you are, and really unaware of all that is taking place. There are things that, and I'm becoming more aware of this, that there are things that take place in our lives uh, that when we you know, find ourselves in the presence of other people, we may react or act in a certain way, but have no idea what kinds of things they are really going through and really don't examine the fact that they may be going through something terribly traumatic and yet we're just examining the outward appearance and responding to that and it's completely inappropriate and it's completely painful to the one who's already going through something. In this room, we may have people who are going through trials that are very painful and needing to have comfort brought to them. And yet, when I, I would hope that not in this house, any pain would be inflicted here. But going out from here, go across the street into a store and might find yourself, maybe you don't even have to get across the street, you might find yourself on the street up there and somebody does something to uh, cause even greater pain to us. And so just remember that when we are involved in other people's lives, whether it's just a pa in passing or have an, a relationship with them, that there are things that each one of us is going through that we really are unaware of. And just to represent Christ in everything that we say and do, always be an uplifter and an encourager not a terror down and a discourager, because it's easy to be that, especially in the days in which we live. There's a lot of discouraging things going on around us, but we are those who are not like the world. We are those who are like Christ. And even in his moment of being scourged and crucified, he's praying for the people that are out there. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they didn't. If they had known who he is they would not have done what they did. They believed that he was involved in some sort of deception saying that he was the Son of God but that he really wasn't because if they had honestly believed that he is God that they would not have done what they did. It, it, in, if their belief was complete despite the fact that they wanted to hold on to their power they still would not have then attacked the Son of God himself because God is eternal. God is not only Savior, but he is the judge. And one day, everyone will stand before Jesus and 
as we stand before him, we will see him either as the Savior, our Savior, or as our judge. And none of us wants to have him be the judge because our judgment is already washed away as he has become our Savior. And so those that are there around him are mocking him. They're saying, and last time we looked at how many times they said, come down from there. Come down from the, the cross. If you come down, then we'll believe. And they, that's, not, that's not true. They were just saying that what it was that caused some of them to believe was not that he didn't come down from that cross, but that he did rise from the dead and that he showed himself to many in the time following after his resurrection. So as we looked at his death upon the cross, we looked at the fact that Jesus in his last two statements said, it is finished. The work of salvation is completed. It is not something that can be added to or taken from. He is the one who did it. It is finished and it is accomplished through Jesus Christ. It, the debt was paid on the cross of Christ, and all who will receive the gift of salvation through Christ have our debts paid off. <clears throat> I don't know, I think everybody in here, uh, I don't think there's any renters in here, I think we're homeowners. What would you do if somebody was to all of a sudden say, your house is paid off, it's, the debt is wiped away? you no longer have a monthly house payment, it's gone. Would there be rejoicing in your home? Would there be rejoicing in your heart? Yes. Yeah, I, don't, I don't see how that could not be the case, but the greater debt that we have been born with is that debt to sin. And the wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid those wages, he wiped away that debt, and we have been, we are now free. And he who has been set free is set free indeed, Amen. and completely. So we have that freedom now, uh, because he has accomplished that freedom upon the cross. Then he said, in his last words from the cross, Father, into the, thy hands I commit my spirit. That is, he gave up his spirit in that moment, he had said, no one takes my life from me, I willingly give it up, and he did so. And we looked at those uh, moments again on Sunday in our study in Ecclesiastes that we do not ourselves have the ability to hold on to the, uh, the life that, we, that is inside of us, our souls. We do not have the ability to add one day to that number that is the number that our days are. Are up. Whatever the day that is, you, we all have a birthday, right? What day we were born physically into this world. And I think everybody in this room has a spiritual birthday as well. I know both of my birthdays because I was, I was already an old man when I got saved. I was 27 or 26. And so being that, you know, an old guy like that, um, I remember that my spiritual birthday is July the 25th. That's the day that I gave my heart to Christ. And, and being born again uh, in that very moment, I remember that as he came in, I guess because in part I was working in a golf shop at the time that I realized, I thought, you know, I'm getting a mulligan. I get a second shot at this, and uh, I get to start all over. I have a clean slate. God has paid that debt, and, uh, and he has given me the opportunity to live life the way that he intended it to be lived, uh, and that is in worship, because we were created to worship. And in that moment, I, I had gone, I had been at the retreat for three days, and I had been trying to learn the songs. I didn't really know why. And then in that moment that I went into the sanctuary after receiving Christ, all of a sudden I realized I'm, it's, they're not just songs, I'm worshiping the Lord. And I'm worshiping him in the study of his word. It, this is what's been accomplished now. It is a finished work. There isn't anything I can do to add to it or subtract from it. Jesus did it. He paid the debt and he has saved us. We were once lost and now we're found. 
We were once dead and we are now alive in Christ because of His amazing grace and because of the work that He did upon the cross. In our text, in verse 57 of Matthew 27, it says then, When evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. This is an interesting thing because Joseph of Arimathea, being a religious leader in the Sanhedrin, was somebody who was fully aware that if he was to be involved in Jesus, in any kind of relationship with Jesus at all, that immediately he would be cast out of the Sanhedrin. Not only that, but as somebody who was going to be then touching a dead body on the Sabbath, that he would not be able to worship in the temple during the Passover. And so he's, all of a sudden, he's coming out, and that which he had been involved in secretly, he is now openly uh, tying himself to Jesus. It's a full commitment at this point. He is no longer in the shadows. He is out there in the front, and he says, I don't care what happens to me. This is my Savior, and I am going to uh, offer to uh, the family to allow him to be buried in my tomb, the tomb that he had, had carved out for himself. And he went to Pilate, Punches Pilate, and he asked for the body, and because Pilate recognized who this man as, was as a religious leader in the community, he, he commanded that it be given to him. In verse 59 it says, When Joseph had taken the body and wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. I did not realize this until a couple days ago that my, our daughter did not know what the Shroud of Turin is. Does anybody know, not know what the Shroud of Turin is? If you don't know, you don't have to raise your hand, I'm going to tell you anyways. The Shroud of Turin is a cloth that is a full body cloth that has the uh, photogenic uh, figure of a man on it that they say that the only way that that could have been tr uh, transferred onto that cloth was a super intense high light and that in doing so it basically created a photo negative like I think we're all old enough to remember when when you take a picture it, what, it was on film not just in, in, in the electronic thing. it was like a negative and this Shroud of Turin is a sheet that has the image, the negative image of a man on it. And because uh, our daughter didn't know anything about it, I started to explain it to her. And the reason that it came up to me uh, in, in conversation was because I have, uh, I'm in this Facebook group that's called uh, something about uh, computer imaging. And they take old statues, Julius Caesar, and the computer uh, corrected to show according to that statue, if that's an accurate statue of him, then this is what he looked like. And it will go through the process of creating this computer image of what Julius Caesar actually looked like as a human. And it, uh, you know, it's done that with Cleopatra and uh, Shakespeare and all, based on images that they, they come up with. Well, a couple nights ago, here comes this Shroud of Turin, and it starts to computer generate what the man whose image is on this sheet looks like. And, you, and so the question at the bottom says, is this what the earthly Jesus, what his body, his face looked like when he walked here on earth? And it's fascinating. So this Shroud of Turin goes back uh, uh, the earliest traces of its uh, movement in culture, it goes back to about the year 1250 or so. So it goes back about 800 years where people started to carry it around and they had said, this has been in our family, this has been in hiding, this, you know, and then all of a sudden it's public and all of a sudden 
you know, somebody gets a hold of it and it gets burned in a fire. Uh, portions of it were, were burned in the fire. So they decided at this point they're going to protect it with everything they can. Every once in a while, they will bring it out and allow people to, uh, to take a look at it. And it's in glass, it's, it's airtight uh, so that it doesn't de degrade. And uh, so they, they bring it out into public and people will flock by the hundreds of thousands to see it. Because it's only out for a short time and then it goes back into wherever they keep it. Uh, I don't remember the last time, it wasn't that long ago that it was out and available to be viewed, but uh, it's not very often. I think it's every couple of decades or whatever. It's interesting, but what is it the image? Was it his shroud? Was it that those linen cloths that Joseph of Arimathea wrapped him in? There are very uh, well-respected individuals who say yes and very well-respected individuals who say no. You know what is important about that is that we don't know and why that's important is because if we did know what would happen people would worship the linen cloth and they would lift it up and begin to offer to it the, the, because people will do that. Any image that they think uh, is a representation they, and we we see that we know entire systems that are set up to do such things. But um, so it's good that we don't know. But it is interesting to see it. And it is interesting to consider maybe, maybe it is, and maybe it's not. It's almost like uh, Noah's Ark, you know, in search of Noah's Ark. Wouldn't it be great if they found it? Yeah, it would. But what's the problem uh, with finding it? Then all of a sudden, everybody's wanting a piece of it. And they're going to chip away at you know, and and I've been around a, a lot of people who uh, who have a lot of expertise in that area who said, oh yeah, it's right here. They've showed me pictures, and I've seen pictures of what looks. Does it change anything in my life? Zero. I believe by faith, not because I see the image of an ark somewhere in the side of a mountain, or the image of a man on a shroud. It doesn't. My faith is not based on what I see, it's based on what I know and what uh, we've been given in His Word, right? Amen. Amen. So, uh, it says here that Joseph wrapped his body in clean linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb which had been hewn for out of the rock. Okay, so I've been to Gordon's tomb. Has anybody else in here been in Gordon's tomb? In Jerusalem. Um, Gordon's tomb is one of two places that are basically considered to be the tomb by which Jesus was laid in. One of them is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built on top of this place, which they say is the place where his body was laid. Uh, Gordon's tomb is a tomb that has been, that was discovered a number of years ago that is carved out of the side of, of the hill and you Back when I went there in 1989, you could go in it and to a certain point. And I don't think you can go in it any longer because people were doing what people do when they get inside of a site like that. And so it's interesting because you go inside and you look at the carving and the way that it was carved, it was carved with the height of a certain individual in mind. And then it was extended because the person who was actually laid in that tomb was taller than the original intended occupant. And so what they, you know, what those who hold this to be the resting place, the, the tomb that Jesus was laid in, it says, well, he was taller than, than most. And so they had to uh, extend it a little bit. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard this a number of times. You know, Joseph of Arimathea, it was extremely expensive to have a tomb carved in, in that way. I mean, it, you had to pay somebody to, to own this thing out and then to do this at the last minute. And, and what kind of generosity would it have required for him to offer up his own, the tomb that was intended for him? And uh, I've heard it said a number of times, well, he understood, he believed that Jesus was going to be raised in three days and so he, he looked at it more as a loan rather than a 
you know, a permanent thing. Get it? Yeah. He's only going to need it for three days. Yeah. So, uh, that being said, um, one of the things that they explain about the tomb is that, and one of the reasons that they believe it to be that place, was that it was converted in the uh, first century AD into a church that they were holding services inside that tomb. And there are certain indicators that reveal that to uh, those that are there. And uh, so in scripture, we're told that they were holding services on the day of the Lord, which would be the day that he was resurrected. So every Sunday, and that they were probably meeting in that tomb initially as uh, that place of this is where he was resurrected. And so this was an, uh, uh, it was a site that became a church. And so that's another reason that they're thinking, this is probably it. I'll tell you that when I was there, it is in the midst of a garden, and that the, some of the trees that are around there are over 2,000 years old. So some of those trees, those olive trees there, uh, have, were there at the time. And, and it's pretty overwhelming to sit in the little amphitheater that they've built around it and to consider that this may be the spot where Jesus himself was resurrected from the dead. And I remember a song, a hymn, uh, all of a sudden was on my heart. And I'm singing a song that I didn't even know that I knew. Uh, Christ the Lord is risen today. And, and I'm, 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 I'm singing and it's like, here it comes, it's just kind of coming out of me. And then I, I went over and I sat down and I looked and on, there, on a sheet of paper was that song was written there that I just sat down next to right after I finished singing this song. I thought, you know, this is, this is probably the Spirit leading worship in everybody's hearts. As you, you're right here, you're going, Christ the Lord is risen. And you're in that place, that tomb. The interesting thing about this tomb is that uh, what is a tomb intended to be? It's intended to be a place, the final resting place for somebody who's, who's placed in it, the occupant of it, right? So it says here that Joseph of Arimathea, it says that he rolled the stone. He did not himself roll that stone. Because uh, when you look at the, the size of the stone and the weight of that stone, he had help. That stone, if you look it up, it says that it weighed between one and two tons, between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds, and no man is rolling that thing by himself. It says that when uh, the women came on the day that he was resurrected, that they, their question in their hearts was, how are we going to get the stone away? The stone is intended to do what? It's not a, they weren't thinking, okay, this is going to hold the occupant in. They had no anticipation that the occupant was going to be coming out. The idea was to keep thieves and robbers from going in. And that's, that was the purpose of that. That if, uh, you know, there are, we, we see grave robbers everywhere. You know, they, they would break into the pyramids, right? And steal from the pharaohs and, and everything. They, they've been going, it's been going on forever. Now to go and to break into this tomb, uh, this would have been quite a task because it says that on the next day, in verse 62, which followed the day of the preparation, that the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, how he deceived and said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night, and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. So the Pharisees came to Pilate and said, okay, this man has been teaching that he will rise on the third day. After he, after he dies, he will rise on the third day. And we want to make sure that this isn't the case, that there, there is no... Uh, stealing of his body, and then his disciples would say, okay, he's risen from the dead. That if that was to take place, that th this deception would be even greater than the, the first. What's the first deception that they're talking about, which was not a deception? The word 
became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God, that he is God himself. That was what they considered to be the first deception. And now they're saying if he rises, if, if his body goes, goes uh, missing, that they're going to say that he rose from the dead, just like he said, and that uh, that deception will be even worse than the first. Which is interesting because the, the Pharisees are saying, we remember that he said that, where's his disciples? His disciples are, are they're, they're, they're running scared, right? They were the ones who should have been remembering that he said he would rise on the third day and in anticipation of his resurrection. And instead, they're, they're in hiding. And, and uh, Judas is gone, Peter is in a horrible shape, and the other ten are uh, in hiding. And they should have been the ones who were saying, remember he said he's going to rise on the third day. Remember he said he's going to rise on the third day. Instead, they're nowhere to be found. The Pharisees go to Pilate and say, this tomb needs to be made secure because if he goes missing, this is, it, it will be bad for everybody. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So the question here is, when Pilate said, you, you have your guard, does that mean you have a guard? use your guard or you have the guard that you've requested we will make a guard uh, available to you and make that tomb as secure as as is necessary how many guards does, is it believed and who are the guards that were set there it's believed that they were roman guards maybe temple guards uh, alongside of them um, but that there were roman guards and probably in, in number about four guards and that they were on four shifts during the day or, and night. That it, theoretically there would be 16 guards and that this would be the, the, the protection, the security on that tomb. On top of the fact that the, the stone itself is between two and 4,000 pounds, uh, it's a pretty secure situation, you would think. <coughs> I thought it was interesting though, um, somebody had mentioned in, in uh, one of the studies that I was listening to, somebody was mentioning the fact that these guys really didn't think this thing through. That um, by setting a guard on there, they basically said it would be impossible for his body to be missing. If they had said, well, just kind of leave it uh, alone, and if, if he truly does come out of there, uh, then we can say that it was easy, his body was easily stolen. But because there's a guard there, because there's a stone there, because it's impossible for anyone to get and break in, because those guards understood that if there was anything that would take place, that they would have to pay the penalty themselves, escape and, and, uh, and failure in this would have resulted in the death penalty for them. If they had failed in that, if they had gone to sleep, if they had done anything to, to be the failure in the situation, they would have been put to death. So they're, they're pretty serious about guarding this tomb. And yet, uh, we're very much aware of the fact that despite all this, that Jesus came out of that tomb, didn't he? Uh, and aren't you thankful for that? When when looking at this, there's a couple of things that I wanted to look at as well. Um, there is a spiritual application that I think we can look at here in these verses, and that is the tomb that was once our heart. Our heart was once a place where darkness dwelt, where uh, there was no light whatsoever in us. We were dead and, uh, and had no hope. And uh, that the tomb that once was in that condition was changed in the moment that Jesus himself entered in and brought with him life and light and gave to us the hope that only he brings into us 
And he has set a guard on us, on our hearts these, now. We have guards. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Do you know where the guards are located in, for us? Uh, they, they are located in uh, our ears. We have gates that uh, have the, the ability to go in and go out. The ear gate. There are guards on our ear gate. Uh, the eye gate. We have guards on our eye gate to protect us from what, those things that we see. The guard at our heart. And you know, a guard, uh, an earthly guard, is only going to be so strong, and, and that's not very strong. A godly guard is, is infinitely strong. Remember he set the guard at the entrance to uh, the Garden of Eden. As he cast Adam and Eve out, he put an angel at the, at the entrance, and no one's been back. And, uh, and he has a guard on our hearts as well. And there isn't anything that can invade our hearts that will overtake them and cause us to once again be in darkness in that way. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Yeah. And, uh, and the security that he provides in our heart is uh, stronger than anything that can come up against us. It, it, it's important for us to, we, I have conversations every once in a while, and part of the testimony that we have is who we once were, the things we once did, yep. and uh, the things that we, the, the areas where God has made us stronger, but the strength that we have is his strength. We are weak. He is strong. The guards need to remain, even in the places where we're thinking, I got this. This is not an issue for me anymore. This is not an area anymore. He says, Don't, do not remove the guards from those areas, uh, because they are what, uh, that's where the strength comes in the protection. So, you know, I, I, I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to do it anyways. My, my wife has been doing with the children's ministry the whole, whole armor of God. Um, and, uh, and in doing that, I said, if you want to provide a visual for them, the visual that I gave when I did that study for children was I brought in my hockey equipment because I used to play um, roller hockey. And, um, and then I started somehow convincing my wife to let me buy equipment. And uh, so when, with all that equipment on, it's really hard to get hurt. Um, it, can, it can be done, but it's really hard to, to get hurt because I've got a helmet, I've got a, a breastplate, I've got shin guards, I've got gloves on, I've taken hockey pucks to the head, um, and it, it'll rattle the bell a little bit, but it, you know, if I didn't have that helmet on, it would have taken out some teeth and you know other things. So uh, it's important to have all these pieces of equipment on. But there is a place we're still vulnerable. And where is that? It's our back. There is no padding in the back. There's no sh there's no, no shield, no nothing in the back. You turn around and start to run, and you can take a hockey puck, and it'll it'll take you down. Um, who covers our back in, in the whole armor of God? God does. And, and he uses one another. He uses us to watch each other's back as well. You see an attack coming at your brother or your sister, uh, you want to be there for them um, because that's, that's what we're here for, right? Uh, to watch out for one another and to be those people that God uses to make sure that nothing comes at you from behind. The enemy is a coward. And he comes at you from behind. You know, I, I heard, uh, you know the scripture which says that uh, he's like a roaring lion and he's seeking to devour and destroy us. You know how a lion actually works uh, and, and takes down his prey? He, what he does is he comes at you and he roars. And then he just stops. And he waits for you to turn around and start running. Because he's planted other lions out there behind you. And as you turn around and start running, you run right into the pack, and they take you down. Um, our God is uh, 
mighty. He is our strong tower, he's our shield, and we, have no, we do not need to be afraid of the enemy. Uh, we want to be a people who recognize that our God has uh, given to us a strength that the enemy is not able to penetrate. He's put a guard on our hearts, he's put a, a guard in our ears, on our eyes, and on our mouth, I hope. Because uh, the mouth is a, it can be a very, very vicious uh, instrument. But if he puts a guard on our mouth, I, I used to call that guard uh, the funnel of love, the guard on the mouth. Because let everything be funneled through love that you speak before you speak it. Um, you know, I hated the idea of texting when it first came out because I thought, why would you do that? What's the point of texting? Um, but I've come to realize that texting is very good for me because what it does is it stops me from immediately responding in ways that I might otherwise immediately respond and then go, whoops, I better put some grace in this because um, this, this needs to have grace in it. And, um, and so it's, it's turned out to be a, a good thing. I, I couldn't figure out for the life of me why anybody would text. Like, why not just call me? You know, but um, it's because it, it actually acts as a funnel of love. It allows me to wait and, and on the Lord and say, how do you want me to say this? How do you want me to respond to this? Because that's what's going to be the encourager. That's what's going to be that which watches out for the hearts of other people. Because, again, I don't know what's going on in the, your life. You, know, you, may have, you may be going through something terribly traumatic, and I don't know it. And if, you know, and if I respond in a way that is going to just add to that, how sad is that? We, we are a people who are supposed to, um, you know, respond in love. So if we just are a little patient about how we respond and then consider the heart of the people that we're talking to, that's always going to be wise. And, uh, and James even said, you know, the one who governs, who's able to control the tongue, he's the wise man. He's the one who's truly wise because the, the tongue is a vicious thing. And if it's not governed uh, with love, then it is going to be something that is going to do a lot of damage. You know, how, how, how does a forest fire start? Starts with one flame, yeah, one, one spark, whatever it is. And then uh, you, people are losing their homes and everything else. Guard your heart, guard your eyes, your ears. Allow God to be that strength in those areas and remain so. Make sure that the tomb, which now is that tomb that has light and, and love in it, uh, is secure and that God is doing uh, amazing things in there and then through there for his glory. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for seeking us and then showing to us uh, who you are. And as our hearts then opened up to you and you brought into our hearts your presence, uh, your light, you washed away those things that were there that were killing us, the sins, and you've given to us life with you. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do every single day, those things that you do that we see and know and are thankful for, those things that you, we don't even see or know that you're doing, uh, but we are thankful that you're doing it. We pray, Lord, that we would be a people who are very, very uh, slow to speak and quick to listen and listening to you then speak. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen the guards around us, that you would be our shield and our strength in every day and we, once again, look forward to, with great anticipation, your coming. This would be a wonderful day for a wedding. And so we pray, Lord, that if this is the day, the bride says, come. And we pray, Lord, that you do. Soon and very soon. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for one last song.
thank you that we did on our spiritual birthday surrender to your love that our names then being written in your book of life have given to us that promise that soon and very soon we are going to be in your presence physically that we are going to be face to face with our God our Savior our Lord we thank you Lord that you are the one who saved us that our salvation is on based on your work the work of Jesus upon the cross that it isn't anything that we've done no one can boast of our own works but it is we boast in Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior we thank you Lord that soon and very soon we're going to hear the sound of the trumpet we're going to see the face of our king and we thank you Lord that this will be that moment where in the twinkling of an eye all eternity for us each one of us begins as we worship you throughout time without end we thank you and we do praise you for that future that we have that hope that we have in jesus and we thank you in jesus name amen and the lord bless you and keep you and the lord make his face to shine upon you the lord be gracious to you and the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in jesus name amen god bless you